Pastor Alan Galloway shared the message, Peace is Presence, part of the Exiles in Babylon series at First Christian Church of Napa on November 10, 2024. How's everybody doing? It's okay. How you really doing? Yeah? Anybody feeling anxious? Uh, oh, according to social psychologist Jonathan Hyatt, who just recently uh, wrote a book called The Anxious Generation, uh, which is talking about primarily young people in the days that we live in with smartphones, social media, uh, addictive online gaming, on and on, so that there's a great rewiring that's going on of childhood. It's causing great sense of anxiousness. You know what I find interesting about that? I don't think it's just the younger generation. There's an anxiousness amongst us, and um, I think it infects us all. In fact, we look for ways to try to soothe some of that. Uh, what, what, what do you find helpful to kind of relieve your stress, your anxiety? Breathing. That's one of the things that I do. That's something new. Just go ahead. You can do it. I give you permission. You don't even need to take your phone out, right? Sometimes talking to somebody. I've had a couple conversations this week. Uh, with folks that were dealing with some anxious things, anxious feelings. I found one that was really interesting, and we're going to do it in our staff meeting this week. It's uh, plunge your face into an ice-cold bucket of water. It actually works. It actually resets your, your ideas. You're, like, you're laughing. This is true. This is my serious face, right? <laughs> Here's the truth. All of us, I think, deal with anxiety at some level. And when I say anxiety, this is what I mean by that, because it's one of those terms that gets kind of tossed out uh, often in culture. And um, what I mean is that there's a feeling of fear that comes over you. I know in 2018, uh, I experienced a sense of fear that came over me. I didn't know what it was. Uh, It was incredibly powerful. Uh, For weeks, I couldn't sleep. I couldn't eat. Uh, I really was having just lots of thoughts of doom and disaster, uh, catastrophic thinking. Uh, And that's what that anxiety is, what it comes over us. And I think we all deal with it. Um, Think about this. Over the last few years, we kicked off a new decade with a pandemic. Yay, right? We kicked it off, and then it was uh, just continued to accelerate. There was loss of loved ones, loss of jobs, loss of educational experiences and major milestones for students, loss of relationships. I'm still pondering how a simple fabric mask could divide a a 20, 25-year relationship. It's amazing. It's amazing. Uh, Add to that stress of aging parents, anxious kids, rising cost of living. Uh, Did I mention wars and rumors of war? Is anybody feeling anxious? Right? Thank you, Pastor Allen, for helping me feel this. And then to top it off, this last week, we experienced the most important election of our lifetime. Now, note, that phrase or some variation of that phrase has been used for like the last 200 years. Interesting, interesting, huh? Well, what do you do? The election passes, but anxious feelings remain. Is anybody feeling anxious? Just take a deep breath, right? In fact, I want to invite you in with me just as we start today, just breathing in the grace of God. Just do that with you. You might want to close your eyes, just open your hands. Just breathe in. I mean, the wonders of God's grace. I mean, physically breathe in and hold it there. And just let go. Maybe there's a stress that you are experiencing, it's even causing some anxiety um, that you just can't seem to uh, get past today. Well, God wants to meet you right here in this moment in these anxious thoughts and feelings. So just breathe in his grace. Go ahead, take a deep breath again. Let it out. And as you let it out, just release what that is that you might be wrestling with and struggling with. Jesus, we thank you that you are a good shepherd. And as a good shepherd, you lead your sheep. We are your sheep. Today, we invite you to lead us wherever you might desire to take us. We give you praise in your name, Christ the Lord. Amen. Amen. 
this feeling of anxiousness, I think it has to, uh, it reminds me of what Jesus said and what we've been talking about in this series of be in this world, but don't become of it. We live in the world, but we don't want to become of it. And that's what we're seeing in Daniel's story. The prophet Daniel, if you have a Bible, Old Testament passage of Daniel, open up to that book today. In fact, open up to chapter one. I'm going to do something a little different today. Next week, I'm going to end the series on Daniel, kind of compressing a few chapters, 10, 11, and 12 together. So I am going to hop around a little bit. But today, I want to kind of grab on to the macro view of how Daniel disciples us or his counsel to us and what we've been learning. Uh, Somebody might ask a question of what is the one thing, the top thing that you have learned from Daniel? So you can go ahead and send me uh, a note, an email, a text, whatever it might be. What's that one thing that has risen to the top for you? For me, it's been a number of things. And so I'm just going to kind of compress some of those down for us today. Uh, In Daniel's story and what he has been counseling me over these last few weeks, Here's Daniel. Just again, if you haven't been able to catch up with the whole series, Daniel has uh, come to a particular time in his life where there's political, cultural, even personal upheaval. Uh, And at uh, the center of all of that, Daniel comes across as somebody who's just really just poised, right? Just kind of like confident in what's going on and the chaos around him. I've said a few times to myself, it's like, whatever Daniel has, I need more of. Amen? I know it is. Well, what does Daniel have? Daniel has peace. Say that with me, peace. Peace. Daniel has this peace. And I'm not talking like a generic kind of bumper sticker peace. We all have those. We've seen those. Uh, this is like a tangible peace. It's, it's, it's real. It's in the midst of the chaos and the turmoil that he has experienced and the confusion. In fact, we could say this. Daniel was a non-anxious present, presence in a very anxious world. He just had this thing about him. And there's something that's just very powerful. And I think that our world could use more of that. Our nation, our homes could use a little bit more of that Daniel piece. Well, how do you get there? How do we find that piece? Well, I want to take us right back to the beginning of the story of Daniel in chapter 1. And as Nebuchadnezzar enters in to the city of Jerusalem, and completely destroys it, completely conquers the people. Uh, There's death, there's mayhem, and Daniel and his three friends are dragged off with some others to Babylon to be re-educated, to to be renamed, to, in other words, become disciples of the Babylonian culture. And what's Daniel's posture? Hint, hint, we just said it. Peace, right? There's a peace amongst them. So Daniel chapter 1, verse 1, in the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. This is what's really important, this phrase right here. And the Lord delivered Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hands. In other words, Daniel, and again, how old was Daniel at this point? Middle teens, 14, 15, 16. At that point, he recognized that God was up to something. God is moving in the midst uh, of the chaos and the turmoil and the pain and the uh, grief and loss, the destruction, confusion. God is doing something. God is moving. God is allowing what is taking place right now. This is the first thing that I'm learning that from Daniel's counsel. You need to invite God into the story. Invite God into your story. Now, maybe you feel like, hey, I've done that. I've kind of made a confession to faith, but I think it's something a little bit deeper. I think it's this idea that I'm continuing to invite God into the story. I mean, again, just take a look around us, the world. We can easily say, man, it feels like things are out of control. Life is just spinning so fast, moving so fast, things are out of control. But can I tell you something? It's not Uh uh-huh. Now you're looking at me like you're not totally convinced, right? It's not. Well, why would I say that? Because Jesus rules and reigns today. He is the king of what? Kings. He is the Lord of lords. God is in control. God is in control in every moment when we experience a loss of control, when things feel like they're very fragile. God is in control. This is a powerful truth when it comes to this idea of anxiety. Anxiety seems to be weakened in the presence of Jesus. If you feel anxious thoughts, you have anxious feelings, stress comes over you, there is a weakening of that as the presence of Jesus increases in your life. Well, why is that? Here's what I have found. There's probably a number of reasons, but one of the things I found true in my life is that when anxiety is present, 
uh, and I begin to press into Jesus, I recognize that anxiety is teaching me, training me, discipling me to look at the future without Jesus. So it's common. I mean, it's natural to feel some fear, to feel some anxiousness, some confusion uh, about life if I'm looking at life and I'm looking at the future without Jesus in it. And so all those like what ifs. Does anybody experience the what ifs? Show of hands. What ifs. Look around the person not raising their hand. That's the liars. We'll talk about that next week, right? What if this doesn't work out? What if they say no? What, you know, what if this doesn't happen? What if this happens? I mean, on and on it goes. These what ifs rise up. And what happens when that rises up, those anxious thoughts and feelings, it feels like hope gets suppressed, even oppressed. And so as a Christ follower, as one who is said yes to Jesus, I've invited you into my life, we recognize that we have a future. That future is filled with hope. It's a future where God is in control, where God is at the center, and that's even right now. So when we tell stories, you tell your story to others, you tell your story to others, you tell your story to yourself, right? When we tell the stories, our story, we are doing so with God at the beginning. God, we start with God, which again, God's not surprised by current events. God's not alarmed by the threats of what if, what if? This doesn't happen. What if it doesn't go this way? He's, he's not alarmed. Jesus is peace. There's perfect peace within Jesus. And he's in control right now. Some of you are experiencing some levels of anxiety. You've shared your story. There's certain things. That, you know, what, what if this, right? Don't know about this. and This might happen. Hey, God is in control right now, right in this moment. Right? So when I feel that crush kind of come in, that anxiety kind of feel like it wants to lay siege to, the, uh, to my heart, I got to remind myself, invite Jesus in. Jesus, come in and be king of my life. Jesus, come in and be on the throne of my heart. Jesus, I invite you into the story. When I do that, I tell myself, I tell myself the story. Like, I don't need to freak out. I don't need to worry about God. God's got this. God is in control. Uh, with my with the future, uh, my future is secure with Jesus. Your future is secure with Jesus, right? I don't have to be stressed. I don't have to uh, freak out. Now, that's not just at a global level, a national level. It's very much at a personal level. Jesus, come into my story. Jesus, you are king as you lay in that hospital bed. Jesus is king. Jesus is king when the principal has invited you to their office for the fourth time this month. Jesus is king as you leave your 10th job interview with no success. Jesus is king when you recognize I have to have that hard conversation with that person that I deeply care about, but is really, really difficult to converse with. Jesus is king. Jesus, I invite you in. And when we invite Jesus in, his presence, as he comes in, his presence, there is peace. In fact, that's one of his names. He is the prince of, guess what? Peace. He brings it. As he comes in, you invite him in. He brings himself, which is the very essence of peace. And that anxiousness, at least for me, that anxiousness begins to drift. It doesn't necessarily disappear, but its grip begins to loosen. John 16, Jesus said this, I have told you these things that you may have what? Peace. In this word, you're going to have what? Happy, happy. Joy, joy. Trouble, but take what? Heart, I have overcome the world. Inviting Jesus into the story, in your story, those anxious knots, those, those feelings of uh, I, I'm just losing control. Things are not going according to my plan. The dogs of doom begin to bark loud. Jesus, I invite you in to my story. You are peace. How many of you just feel like, man, I just need peace today? 
peace. Amen. Amen. But Daniel's story doesn't start there or stop there. It, in fact, it continues on, and we see that peace continue to be present in Daniel's life and in his friend's life. Remember, Nebuchadnezzar had these dreams. He was uh, quite a dreamer, and that one time he had this dream that he could not get a uh, interpretation, and that sent him into a rage. And he makes kind of a hasty decision, kill them all, right? I'm going to kill all the wise people because they are of no good to me, no use to me, and Daniel is a part of the company of the wise men. But Daniel's posture, again, is this place of peace, and so he's composed. And you think, well, how do you do that? Man, if somebody came to you and just said, okay, guess what? We're going to cancel you literally tomorrow. I'm not sure I'd be all that peace-filled, right? I'd be kind of freaking out a little bit. But he does something very remarkable. Daniel leans in with a few friends, a small group, if you will, in chapter 2, verse 17. He hears this message. He hears what the king has ordered. It says this, Then Daniel returned to his house and explained the matter to his friends, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. He urged them to plead for mercy from the God of heaven concerning this mystery. And the mystery was related to what the king had dreamed and to get the interpretation of that dream so that he and his friends might not be executed with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. Here's the second thing, that we live in peace with some faith-filled friends. It's very purposeful, faith-filled friends. A lot of us have different friends and acquaintances and friends at work and friends in the neighborhood and uh, friends from school, uh, friends we went to university with. You know, we have all these friends, but we're talking faith-filled friends, those who are journeying with you on this path towards heaven, on this path towards God and being with God. See, we all need that. We need one another. Anxiety is always attempting to cut you off from relationship. It wants to isolate you. And that's why faith-filled friends are so vital to the journey of faith that we are in. When you feel like life's kind of spinning out, out of control, We've all been there, and we'll probably be there again. When you feel those anxious feelings come in, it is often those faith-filled friends who kind of steady you, who kind of bring you back to what is true, what is noble, uh, what God has been doing in your life, what God is doing uh, right now in your life, and what God will do in the future in your life. To bring you back to that, I believe that friends, faith-filled friends, are God's, one of his primary antidotes to the virus of anxiety that plagues us all. Do you have some real good faith-filled friends? I'm talking those that you call in the middle of the night when you're really feeling the stress and the anxiety. So I think peace is often strengthened within that context of a biblical community. It's why the New Testament writers are often said, don't neglect this. Continue to meet together. Because we need one another. We need these faithful friends. In fact, we see that quickly in Daniel and his three friends, right? Remember the story of the fiery furnace? Nebuchadnezzar's saying, uh, I'm going to build this great idol, and you're gonna, everybody's going to bow down and worship, and everything's going to be wonderful and joyful, right? And what do the three Hebrew sons say? No. No, we're not going to bow down. Uh, No, we're not going to worship the idol of gold. In fact, chapter 3, verse 16, here's their response. King Nebuchadnezzar, and again, this with great wisdom, great tact. They've been breathing in uh, grace for some time. We do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we're thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it. In other words, we believe a God in a God who does miracles. And he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. There's wisdom and tact in their response. But even if he does not, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold that you have set up. I love that phrase. I love that statement. There's just something very powerful about it. It, 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 For me, it reminds us of those who have this incredible confidence Right? There's just this great confidence. Like they know who they are. They know who God is. They know who they are in Christ Jesus. I mean, they just know this, but without all the presumption. Do you know anybody like that? I mean, I know a lot of people who have real high confidence, but man, they are just so full of it. Confidence. What were you thinking? 
right? But there's, no, there's that arrogance is not there, that just that, that kind of like they just, that know-it-all-ism, right? Public service announcement for us. What if we just woke up over the next several weeks, between now and the end of the year? We just woke up each morning, and we just made this great declaration because, again, we live in a, uh, a Babylon system. It's around us. We're, we're not immune from it. But we woke up kind of with that same confidence but with that great humility. That, you know what, king, and whatever king is, right, it could be work, it could be culture, it could be politics. I mean, on and on it goes, right? King, you think you're in charge, but there is a true king who is ruling and reigning. And my future is set with him. My future is secure with him. So no matter what happens this day, he will continue to be my king. I will not bow down. What if you just woke up, just kind of reciting something like that? How would you do that? I mean, how would we get to a place like that? Well, that's the third thing that we learn from the counsel of Daniel. Surrender to God's will. Simply surrendering to God's will. That's what we recognize. Uh, in Daniel, in the life of his three friends, it's able to say, I'm good with God's plan. Are you good with God's plan? If it's going to your plan? Oh, hardly ever. Yes, that'll preach. Um, right? I'm good with God's plan. God, what, whatever you might have, whatever you want to do, I'm okay. I, I'm okay being misunderstood. I'm okay being one that's not invited to be a part of the cool crowd. Uh, you want to cancel me? Okay. My hope is secure in Christ Jesus, the King. It, friends, listen. You're, you, all kinds of things come at you. Spiritual attack, personal attacks. Uh, life feels like it's spinning out of control, and you want to have this peace. Well, listen, peace is released when you surrender. It feels very contrary to what you would naturally think. If I want something, man, I got to go after it. I got to grab onto it. I got to hang onto it with all my might. When I release, that's when peace is present. The peace of God comes in. In fact, we see this idea as Jesus is discipling the disciples in Matthew chapter 6, verse 10. He's telling them how to pray, how to pray with power. And he says, your kingdom come. What? Yeah. On earth as it is in heaven, yeah. That's a powerful prayer. But if you've been part of our discipleship foundations, we take it even further, right? Jesus doesn't teach about it, doesn't talk about it. He actually demonstrates it in his life where we find him in the Garden of Gethsemane praying this very thing. Not my will be done, but what? Father, your will be done. Your will will be done. Jesus did not want the cross. He wanted that cup to be taken from him, but he endured. He submitted himself to what God was up to, what the Father was up to in that moment. Here's what I recognize when I I say I am good with God's plan. What that means is things don't have to go my way in order for me to be at peace with God. Can you say that today? Things don't have to go my way to be at peace with God. God, I'm good with your plan. We have brothers and sisters in the church located in China. And if you're familiar with China, the uh, the Chinese have two different church systems. They have the state-run church, lots of government involvement, and then they have a lot of house churches. And often what happens is in those house churches, the government comes in and seizes the house church, seizes the house Now, it's really interesting because those who own the house, if it's their house, they would respond to something like this. Well, that's okay. It's not mine. I gave this house to Jesus a long time ago. Have you given your house to Jesus? I've given this house to Jesus uh, a long time ago. It's his house. I trust God for my daily bread. I trust God for my daily bed. And so they respond, which is really confusing to the government. So they respond in kind. Well, we'll beat the faith out of you. Right? With a smile. I trust Jesus for my healing. Okay, we're going to send you to prison where no one knows where you're at. You see where this is going, right? Right? That's why the prison ministries often in China are advancing so much because the disciples of Christ have come to a place of surrender where they're like, wherever you take me, God, wherever you want to lead me, I'll go, I'll follow. 
and I'll continue to walk in your ways and say what you want me to say. We'll take your very life. That's okay. I gave my life to Jesus. I'm ready to meet my maker. Now, listen, they don't want to go to prison. They don't want their house to seize, just like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego didn't want to go into the fire, but they'd also come to the place where they were so surrendered to whatever God would have for their lives that they were willing to say, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I surrendered to your will, O God, right? It's really frustrating for someone to try to control a Christ follower who's super surrendered to Jesus. Some of you need to write that down because somebody's trying to control you. Be free in Christ. Surrender him. And then last week we saw in Daniel chapter 6 when the satraps were attempting to lay traps for Daniel to get him not to pray, to get him to uh, go against what he's always done, coming before the Lord and being with the Lord. Uh, And so what does Daniel do? does what he's always done. He goes home. He begins to pray easily. They catch him. They bring him before the authorities. He's tossed into the lion's den. God does another miracle in their lives. And he ultimately is saying, God, my, uh, my life is in your hands. And God shows up. And we see this incredible picture of Daniel's counsel about prayer. All of us have heard prayers, read messages about prayer, heard stories about prayer, the power of prayer, how prayer uh, moves mountains. We've all heard those things, but have we experienced that how powerful prayer is when it is personal? When your prayer is personal, prayer is the posture of the surrendered self before God. And that's where we get to to the story today. And just I want to look at this prayer in Daniel chapter 9. So if you're not there yet, flip over to Daniel 9. Daniel 9, verse 1. In the first year of Darius, son of Xerxes, a Mede by descent, who was made ruler over the Babylonian kingdom, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood from the scriptures, according to the word of the Lord given to Jeremiah the prophet, that the desolation of Jerusalem would last 70 years. In other words, the exile. Their exiles in Babylon, those, that exile would uh, take place for 70 years. Years Now, how old was Daniel when he entered in? Let's say 15, 16. So march forward in time. Some years have passed. Daniel begins to realize that the word of the Lord is about to take place. What God had promised early on is about to become manifested and that it's almost over. God said there's going to be a particular time set on this, and then it will be over. Daniel is now in his 80s. So when we think about that, why is he continuing to pray? I mean, we're almost done. The finish line is in sight, right? We're going to go home. Daniel knows something very powerful. God is sovereign, and God is very personal. God is sovereign, and he's personal, and he invites his people into this partnership of prayer with him and what he's doing in his sovereign acts, his sovereign will, that you'd be a partner in various matters. In fact, verse 3, this is what Daniel recognizes. So I turned to the Lord God and pleaded with him in prayer and petition, in fasting, and in sackcloth and ashes, which is an indication, an understanding, a clue, if you will, of the type of prayer that he's going to pray. And he lays out over these next several verses this prayer. And I'm going to read them, and it's a long passage, and so stick with me. But as I'm reading it, here's what I want you to ask. Holy Spirit, what are you speaking to us today? Jesus, what are you wanting me to hear today through, the, through Daniel's prayer? And I'm going to start in verse 4. I'm going to hit several of the verses uh, as we just ponder this together. Daniel's saying, I prayed to the Lord my God and confessed. Oh, Lord, you are great and awesome God. Your way always, you always fulfill your covenant in keeping your promises of unfailing love to those who love you and obey your commands. But we have sinned and done wrong. We've rebelled against you and scorned your commands and regulations. We have refused to listen to your servants, the prophets, who spoke on your authority to our kings and princes and ancestors and all the people of the land. Lord, you are in the right. But, as you see, our faces are covered with shame. 
This is true of all of us, including the people of Judah and Jerusalem and all Israel scattered near and far, wherever you have driven us because of our disloyalty to you. O oh Lord, we and our kings, princes, and ancestors are covered with shame because we have sinned against you. But the Lord our God is merciful and forgiving. Even though we have rebelled against him, we have not obeyed the Lord our God. We have not followed the instructions he gave us through his servants, the prophets. All Israel has just disobeyed your instruction and turned away, refusing to listen to your voice. Let me drop down here for sake of time. Verse 15. Oh, Lord our God, you brought lasting honor to your name by rescuing your people from Egypt in a great display of power. That's important. Make note of that. But we have sinned and are full of wickedness. In all of our faithful, in all of your faithful mercies, Lord, please turn your furious anger away from your city, Jerusalem, your holy mountain. All the neighboring nations mock Jerusalem and your people because of our sins and the sins of our ancestors. Oh God, oh our God, hear your servant's prayer. Listen as I plead. For your own sake, Lord, smile again on your desolate sanctuary. Oh God, lean down and listen to me. Open your eyes and see our despair. See how your city, the city that bears your name, lies in ruin. We make this plea, not because we deserve help, but because of your mercy. The prayer goes on. I would invite you to spend some time this week. It's it's so, so powerful. I mean, do you hear what the Spirit's saying? This is not some kind of cheap repentance prayer, right? Oh, I'm sorry, right? I'm sorry. Forgive me. Get over it, right? It's not that. It's not rationalizing prayer. It's not a kind of let me shift some blame type of prayer. He uses like 10 different words to describe the sin of the people. In fact, he agrees with God's judgment, God's holiness, and it's right to judge the people who've gone astray. He gets that. He acknowledges that. But did you pick up the pronouns as he spoke? Did you see that? We, us, our, he didn't say anything about they or them, those people over there. Daniel's doing what? Daniel's including himself with the people. Now, this is really powerful, and this is what struck me this week. This is really powerful because when you read through the scriptures and you read through the story of Daniel, Daniel's a pretty good guy, right? I mean, there are some great heroes of the faith, right? There's Noah, and he was a drunk. And there's Abraham, and he was what? Notorious liar. And then what about Moses? He was a murderer. I mean, I love that about the scriptures. It does not pull any punches about the heroes of the faith. But we don't see that with Daniel. At least I didn't see that with him and his story. That's something good about him. There's like a holiness, like he just, he lives what he believes. And as he's praying, he's praying about sin that happened like a hundred years before he was even born. He's praying and confessing for his ancestors. Now, please hear me because sometimes this gets confusing. I'm not saying that you are held accountable for another person's sin. Each one of us is going to stand before God, give an account for the words we say, the things we do, we're all held accountable. But what I am saying here is that we, as the people of God, we are interconnected. We are interconnected with those who have gone before us, as well as those who are around the world who are part of the family of God today. That's why we call it the family of God. We are family. We are joined by blood. Whose blood? Jesus' blood. Right? That's how we're joined together as a family of faith. And so Daniel's not playing some kind of victim card like, oh, these people sin it's so egregious, and now I got to deal with it and bail everybody out. He's not doing that. He's not accusing anybody. Why? Why even bother? Because he recognizes a powerful truth in the Scriptures, that sin is not just simply an individualistic act. 
Sin affects the whole community. My sin, your sin, it affects one another, impacts the entire community. And so therefore, there is this idea of repentance that it is often personal, rightly so. But prayer, uh, repentance and prayer of repentance is also very corporate, is that we pray for the sins of our people. In fact, let me get back to this idea of the we. Who's he speaking to? Who's he speaking about? Who's the subject of the we? Israel, right? People of God, we saw, we saw that. Their sins, right? Interesting is he doesn't address anything about Babylon's sin. No, they weren't sinless, right? Lots of idol worship, greed, lust, you on and on. Daniel, as they say, has seen how the sausage, sausage is made, and he knows. He knows. He's very familiar, and yet at the same time, he doesn't confess their sins, rather, just the family of faith. What do you think that means? Is it possible that sometimes we're too quick to look towards and point out cultural sin and not really take time to address our sin? Too quick to look to those on the outside, neglect what's happening on the inside. I think this is the very fact of what Paul was addressing in 1 Corinthians 5.12. He says, what, as he tells the church, what business is mine to judge those outside the church? Are you not to judge those inside? Now note, by Daniel not addressing or confessing Babylon's sin, by no way means that he approves of it, that he accepts it that it's okay with him. Remember, there was these biblical boundaries, these holy uh, lines in the sand. We're not going to eat the, the, this food that's been sacrificed to idols. We're not going to bow down to idols. Yet at the same time as he does that, it's as if he's much more concerned about the internal sin of the people, his people, his family, than he is with those around him. I think it's easy for Daniel to do what is often done in our culture and cultures around us and before us and probably after us is to kind of point the finger, right, at others. Those Christians over there, right? Well, that church down the street, let me point this way. There's churches this way, right? right? Those churches over there, those pastors, don't listen to them. They're bad, right? They're hypocrites or everyone's favorite word today. They're heretics. I think it's easy to do that and to point down the finger and forget, man, I've got three more pointing back at me. Ouch. Ouch. Right? They're, in other words, it's not that they are the problem. Daniel would say, I'm the problem. I'm part of the problem. That's what's going on. Too easy to look on the outside and not take time to look at the inside. Daniel recognizes that this exile is almost over, and yet he's still continuing to confess the sin of his people, his family, immediate, as well as his ancestry. He understands that family origin and where he comes from. Why does he do that? Because he knows that the exile does not pay for the sin. See that? There's not like, okay, 70 years has passed. Okay, everything's good now. No. It's a consequence of their sin, but doesn't pay for it. What Daniel is doing is something very prophetic. That's why he's referred to as prophet. Daniel is looking forward in faith to a day that will come when God himself will arrive, pay the ultimate penalty for sin's debt, and bring peace that is lasting for eternity. And for those who are in Christ, they step in to that peace today, that peace that's now. It's what I said at the very beginning when I was talking about anxiety, it, it, the, uh, that there's a fear that comes over us, this idea of doom, uh, dread, uh, that seems like it's crushing upon us, and to think that there is no hope, that there is no future. What Daniel counsels us towards is when we combat the anxiety that comes face to face with us, we do it by simply receiving Jesus. Receive Jesus. Right? We receive him in prayer. It's personal. It's powerful. We receive him as we surrender our lives. It's not just a one-time event, but it's a continual surrendering of my life to Jesus. Inviting Jesus into my story. Inviting him into the pain. Inviting him into the what-ifs. Inviting him into the stress. Inviting him into the anxiety. Receiving the counsel. Receiving the peace of Christ. Daniel confesses that sin 
as he looks and sees the sin, and he looks forward towards the deliverance and the rescue of what God can do and only God can do, he can confidently can say, come what may, we are loved by God. Crisis can be national. Crisis is certainly personal. Come what may, we are loved by God. The world feels chaotic and out of control. Come, at, come what may, we are loved by God. We look to Jesus, the very one who gave his life is what it means to demonstrate unfailing love. So come what may, we are loved by God. Thanks again for joining us for today's message from First Christian Church. If you'd like to take a step in your faith and connect with a staff member at FCC, visit fccnapa.org slash connect. To stay up to date on things going on in the FCC community, we invite you to follow us on Facebook and Instagram, and be sure to subscribe to the FCC Napa YouTube channel. Have a great day.